and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker tonight, uh, Audrey, how do you say say your last name? Hi, it's uh, pronounced Blumino. Blumino? It's okay. French, so we've got the extra vowels in there to <laughs> sound out just the O. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Audrey has been uh, teaching digital media and web design in higher education for over 20 years at institutions such as the University of California Santa Cruz Extension, Cabrillo College, and San Jose City College. She's the Distance Education Coordinator at San Jose City College, working with faculty on online pedagogy, content delivery, and accessibility. Ooh, and she doesn't believe in Oxford commas. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. And um, our, our program tonight is called Online Teaching and Accessibility in a Pandemic. The, um, the COVID-19 pandemic changed our lives, jobs, and routines in so many ways. In the world of education, teachers move mountains to pivot from in-classroom instruction to fully online, practically overnight. Over the past couple of years, faculty have become adept at creating and uh, have become adept and creative at providing lectures and assignments to an online environment. One of the overarching challenges among many is ensuring that all content complies with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Audrey will discuss some of the issues and challenges and how teachers are working to ensure that all students are provided equal access to learning content. Okay, Audrey, it's all yours. Well, thank you. And thank you for uh, the introduction. And, um, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I apologize for the missing Oxford comma. I know I have had discussions with my graphic design people about whether you should or you should not use the Oxford comma. And uh, I have to say that I am inconsistent in my own personal use of that comma. Um, and, I, and I feel very um, somewhat nervous being in front of all these technical writers because I'm not necessarily a technical writer myself. And so I become highly acutely aware of <laughs> my own grammatical and writing prowess. So let me, uh, if I can share my screen, I put together a PowerPoint to take me through uh, what I'd like to share and uh, and hopefully you can all see that. I'm probably not going to go into presentation mode. Actually, let me see if this will work. Last time I tried this, I had a bit of an issue. So we'll see if it, does it go in there? Oh, it's working. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. And you're seeing my actual presentation, correct? Yes. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. So. Uh, as was introduced, um, I, I wanted to talk about online teaching and accessibility in a pandemic. Uh, Rachel Lamb had uh, introduced me to coming here uh, two years ago. Uh, she was a student of mine in my class and had mentioned that she was looking for guest speakers and, and then the pandemic hit and my life got turned upside down. So uh, over the last couple of years, we've continuously talked about having me come talk about uh, just teaching in general, but then it turned into online teaching and accessibility and the pandemic and how it's really affected everybody. So let's see, can I get this to work? Yes, nope. there we go. So. March 2020 um, is certainly something that's been uh, burned into my brain. Um, I don't know where you all were at, but it was you know that month that a national state of emergency was announced. And essentially on March 19th, all California, or I should say California, issued their statewide stay-at-home order. And we were actually the first state to issue that stay-at-home order 
essentially mandating that we all had to stay at home uh, unless you had an essential job or you had to shop for essential needs. And so this uh, really hit educators and students in a big way. So millions of teachers uh, and students had to pivot all their course materials and activities to this digital world. We suddenly turned our in-person classroom meetings into Zoom meetings, lecturers who normally would come in and lecture and provide assessments that were provided on paper had to now convert everything into this digital modality. And needless to say, uh, you know, we've got some people who are very tech savvy, uh, who love working with technology. Uh, and then we have a lot of people that do not enjoy working with technology um, or don't have access to it at home. They actually come to school to use technology. So it was an immediate challenge, right, from the beginning. So really the pandemic has really changed how teachers uh, taught their classes and actually continue in terms of teaching their classes. And of course, we've all become extraordinarily uh, familiar with Zoom, which many people had not heard of before the pandemic. Uh, I was fortunate that we had started using Zoom uh, a couple of years before the pandemic, but everybody was like, Zoom, what is that? How do you use it? People were more familiar with Skype uh, as a communication tool. And I honestly don't even know what happened to Skype, why it didn't take off, but Zoom was the thing that we all started using uh, and around the world. And I kind of wish I'd gotten stock in that company uh, before the <laughs> pandemic, but you know, oh well. I didn't have the crystal ball and nobody could have ever foreseen what we were about to go into. So the challenges um, really came down to technology resources, just having a computer at home we, we live in Silicon Valley, so we almost kind of assume everybody has uh, a computer at home, but the fact is that even in San Jose, uh, the, the center of all things technology, there are so many people that do not have a computer at home. And in fact, many faculty do not have laptops or computers at home. And so we immediately found that there was that equity gap right there. Uh, and then there came to be that simple thing of Wi-Fi connections, which I assumed in my house that I had a good connection, uh, but that was something that uh, we found very quickly, either you had Wi-Fi connection, but it wasn't very good, or you uh, didn't have it at all. And so this was another huge challenge for both teachers and students. And then, of course, there was just the simple ability to use the technology. You know, uh, there are many laptops out there that don't have webcams attached to them or microphones attached to them. And so now we had to convey how to get a webcam and how do you attach it and how do you use it? And I remember in the beginning, we had so many people who didn't understand, you know, where the position of the camera was. And so you'd only see like from their eyes upwards, or you'd be looking, you know, straight up their nose or something like that. Um, or they had, you know, the window behind them. So they were just a silhouette. So there were lots of things that, you know, we've gotten much better at uh, over the last couple of years, but boy, the, the first few months, it was just crazy. Uh, and then other issues came in. There was the issue of privacy, right? Uh, generally, uh, people, you know, students, especially in college, would live maybe in the dorms or they'd live in, you know, houses with five other people or they were parents who had children uh, or they were, you know, young kids who, uh, you know, were going to school. And now you were suddenly uh, kind of in their bedrooms um, because they didn't have a physical space. They didn't have a home office. Uh, they were in their kitchens, but maybe it was noisy in their kitchens because other family members were coming in and out to 
cook a meal. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've heard some students were in their bathrooms because that was literally the only room that was actually quiet and you wouldn't be disturbed while you were taking your test or something like that. And of course, nobody wants to, you know, put on their video when they're in the bathroom, not because they're going to the bathroom, but because that was the only room that they could actually be working in. Uh, so there were lots of challenges with privacy. Um, and then there was the physical and mental health that also ensued because, uh, and I don't know how often you've been on Zoom meetings, but if you're on Zoom all day long, it is exhausting. Uh, there's something about, uh, you know, staring into a computer and having your face right there in front of you. Normally, you wouldn't be actually talking and seeing your face at the same time. And so this also added to the challenge of uh, being able to take classes or to even teach classes all day. Uh, somehow it seemed easier when you could just walk into a classroom and, and give your lecture and then walk out and talk to people on the way out. And it was very different. And it's taken time to get used to it. Of course, there are certain advantages to it um, in terms of being online. I, I didn't have to drive to wherever you are. I'm, I'm out in Santa Cruz, and yet here I am able to, you know, have this uh, conversation with you and talk to you about this topic. And uh, maybe it's better for the environment. You know, uh, gas prices are off the charts right now. And uh, for a lot of students, it's actually easier, better to be not having to commute uh, just because it's very costly. So we're learning a lot in, in this pandemic world that we're living in right now. Now, I wanted to talk about um, the laws that go into uh, the kind of documentation that we're providing. So um, one of the things that um, we are mandated by law is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And essentially, it says that nobody can be excluded from the participation in or be denied the benefits or be subjected to any discrimination for any program or activity that receives federal financial assistance. And that's where at least the public schools, community colleges, the CSUs, the UCs, they fall under this because they do get federal financial assistance. So we do fall under the, the uh, laws that Section 508 uh, provides. Uh, there's Title II of the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, uh, that again, Nobody should be excluded from participation or denied the benefits of services, programs, or activities of a public entity or be subjected to discrimination by any public entity. Now, Section 508 uh, in the ADA, these are things that have existed since the 1970s. 1973 is when the uh, Rehabilitation Act was created. So it's been around for a very long time. Uh, I think a lot of people forget this, but in the 1990s, the world changed, right? We all of a sudden were given access to this thing called the internet, which had been around actually since the 1980s, or 70s, um, but now we have this thing called the web. And now people who normally wouldn't be going on to the internet, we're now accessing content on the web. And so in 1998, the US Congress amended the Rehab Rehabilitation Act to require that federal agencies make their electronic information and technology accessible to people with a disability uh, so that it would eliminate barriers to information technology. So, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act requires federal, federal agencies to make their information and communication technology accessible to people with disabilities. It applies to the development, procurement, maintenance, and use of information and communication technology. Agencies must give disabled employees and students and members of the public access to information comparable to the access available to others. That comparable thing is kind of an important thing because 
I, if I have a disability, I should not have to wait for you to suddenly go, oh, I didn't know. Okay, let me go fix that and then give it to you a couple of days later, right? This, this information, whatever it is that you're providing needs to be accessible at the same time. So we all get the information at the same time. And the state of California chose to adopt Section 508 standards under state law back in 2001 uh, under California Government Code uh, 11135 um, that applies the standards to California state entities, including K through 12 system and California community colleges. So we have something called Section 504. And we have section 508. And I find that I, I'm always needing to uh, explain the differences because section 504 provides accommodations to students uh, or to anybody really. And every public entity, every school, every community college uh, is required to have a disability uh, services uh, program on campus that can provide accommodations. That's what section 504 requires. So accommodations, uh, it starts with uh, a request for a specific student need. I see I've got a bullet issue here going on uh, for immediate resolution. Um, and so we also are required to have a compliance officer involved. Uh, and so every school has uh, somebody on campus. Section 508 is the other side of this, where we are providing access to all the content. It's available to everybody at the time that they are needed. Um, it's generalized to the community. Um, there's always a planned ongoing effort to provide accessible content. And generally the entire district or college or campus site is involved. They're essentially required to. Uh, there's plenty of lawsuits going on right now for schools that um, either are based on section 504, although now it's more about section 508. And that's a tricky one because I, as an instructor, could potentially get sued, but it is the institution that is essentially liable. So if I get sued by a student because my material is not accessible, my division, my department, my school uh, gets caught up in that lawsuit as well. And unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of people who don't seem to understand uh, what the parameters are in, in what we're talking about. So I'm going to go through some of that. Essentially, the, the standards that we are required to follow are Section 508. There's Section uh, 255 of the ICT standards, and they overlap into the WCAG 2.0. And I should probably update that because it's 2.1 now. 2.2 is coming down the road uh, of level A and level double A. Triple um, A is very difficult to achieve. Um, so at the present time, it's double A uh, that we're aiming for. And it is getting, uh, I think, more challenging in some ways because uh, the level A is the very base. And it I'm realizing that I probably should explain that WCAG, for those of you that may or may not know, stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that comes through from the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, that sets the standards for all things on the web. And so in the beginning days, it was relatively simple, uh, but like many things in the world, I think when you build something, that's when you should set up your accessibility content and not afterwards, right? It's so much easier to fix things as you go as opposed to after the fact. So when we're defining accessible, uh, that means that a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, 
and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. Um, and sometimes, you know, that substantially equivalent ease of use, there might be certain things that um, you can't do the same way. Um, you know, if you're building something uh, that's very tactile, uh, that's something that you might have to do a little bit differently for a person who is blind than for a person who can see. But there are ways of getting around all of that that are, are possible and I think creative and amazing. And, you know, these are the things that I think I, I really try to convey is the, you know, same information, same interactions, same services that everybody else gets, right? That's the key thing here. People with disabilities are the largest minority group in the U.S. One in four U.S. adults or about 61 million Americans have a disability that impacts major life activities, according to a report in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Um, the U.S. population today, as of 2020 at this time, uh, the numbers were just over 331 uh, million people. So uh, we're talking about a lot of people, right? So 6.4 million people in the U.S. have a visual disability. Um, 10.5 million have some kind of hearing disability. We've got 20.9 million who have some sort of ambulatory disability, 14 million with a cognitive disability, uh, and that means on average that about 13.2 million people in the United States have at least one disability that Section 508 is meant to help with. And the, C, the CCC, the, community, the California Community College uh, Disabilities Program Services serve about 121,000 students. Uh, this was in the 2018-2019 academic year. One thing that I, I want to mention um, is that these are people who um, have declared a disability. Uh, there are lots of disabilities that are not declared and we'll cover that as well. So one of the things that we always talk about is building a culture of accessibility. Um, this cartoon that you're seeing is, is showing uh, a gentleman who's in a wheelchair and several people are standing next to them. There's a person on the stairs that's shoveling snow. Um, obviously this is not California, unless you're in the Sierra somewhere, but um, you know, the, the person in the wheelchair is asking if, you know, could you please shovel the ramp? And the person that's shoveling the ramp says, but all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. But the person in the wheelchair is saying, but if you shovel the ramp, then we all can get in. And that's the whole point of the idea of making content accessible is that it's not just for that one person, but it's for everybody. It affects everybody. And it's similar to the curb cuts on the curbs. That's you know the first accessibility uh, thing that happened back in the 70s uh, when they realized that people in wheelchairs couldn't go from one corner to the next corner because there was a curb and they couldn't get back up the curb and it was very hard to get down a curb. And so curb cuts were created and it was for people in a wheelchair. But it turns out that uh, parents who are pushing their kids in a stroller were benefiting from these curb kit cuts. It affected people who were delivering uh, merchandise and they had a dolly that they were carrying materials on. Um, all of these things, uh, you know, made it so that it actually benefited more than just the person that had some kind of disability. So this cartoon always, you know, makes me, you know, happy to see that we can convey this message in a sort of fun way. So really in the end, students really just want respect. 
Okay, this is this is such a hard thing. They they don't want to make you feel put out. Uh, they they would like to just be respected and not be defined by their disability, and they don't want to feel like it's a burden. Like, do I can I do I have to ask for this you know accommodation? Um, could you please you know do this for me um, so that I can learn this material? It just it it's just very um, humiliating when somebody has to request something that really shouldn't be requested. Uh, they wanna be treated as smart, capable people who can do everything everyone else can do. They just may do it differently. And I think we just need to humanize that. Um, and you know, just look to the fact that, yeah, maybe the way I've been doing things, I can change it a little bit and then it, actually helps a lot of other people along the way. So the kinds of students that we see are either blind or low vision. They have some kind of vision impairment. And so they need a screen reader to read their lecture notes. Uh, or they might be deaf or hard of hearing and require captioning. They may have uh, paralysis or tremors that require maybe a mouth stick for keyboard navigation. Um, those are all very visible disabilities. We usually can tell when uh, a person who's blind or deaf or has paralysis or tremors, uh, we just, we see what's happening. But there's plenty of invisible disabilities. And these are the ones that people might not be talking about so much because they don't want to share that information. It might be embarrassing to them or they actually don't want to be treated differently. So we have cognitive challenges. We have color blindness. We have anxiety, depression, headaches, eye strain. Um, there's, there's a huge list. Uh, and I want to add that uh, the ADA recently added uh, long-term COVID as a disability. It is officially part of the list of disabilities that you can now uh, request accommodations for. Obviously, we have a lot to learn about long COVID uh, and what that means. I, as an instructor, find that what that means is giving a little more space and time for completing assignments if needed. Um, it might require Maybe that a screen reader, something like a voice reader, say on your iPhone, is going to read that material because it causes eye strain or headaches, and it's just easier to listen to. So lots of different things that we are having to deal with, uh, not just in the school system, but in all workplaces. So we want to take a look at building accessible content. There are essentially eight, I call them simple items because they are really, in my mind, very simple. But I have learned that what I consider simple is not necessarily simple to everybody. And I always start off with headings because these are the things that I, I feel like my English teacher back in high school taught us the concept of outlining your your paper, your research document, and those would be your main heading topics, right? So in the world of web design, in the world of your lecture materials, whatever it is that you're writing, you're going to have headings. And because everything is digital, it is based on HTML and um, you know, this is, I think, where Rachel was in my class, and we were talking about this because it's such a simple thing, but very few people recognize this in, say, Microsoft Word, that you would use the styles to create heading levels, and that you start with, say, a heading one, and then you stay in a certain sequence. You don't skip headings. You go to heading two for your subtopic of heading one, and then if you have a subtopic for your heading two, then you would use heading three. And there's six levels of headings, but you don't want to just suddenly skip to heading four if you have not used heading three. Now, 
visually people tend to think of headings in that sense because sometimes the first level heading is larger than the other subsequent headings but actually for somebody using an assistive technology like a screen reader they can actually use their shortcut keys to have their screen reader read out all the heading twos and so they can jump down so say for example i have my syllabus uh, as a, an example, and I, and I have the course schedule, but that's like on page five of my document. So now they can just read all the different headings and jump down to that particular section of my document. Uh, if I had it skipped around, heading three, heading four, it would be very confusing and very disorienting in terms of um, trying to locate that information. So as you're building out, and I, and I tell faculty this all the time, and I tell my web design students this too, is outline your content, uh, look at it as an outline, and apply the correct heading levels. And right there, you've just made your website, your web content, your digital media, your, you know, whatever it is that you're providing to people in a digital format, you've made it accessible. The second item is lists. Now this seems to be such a simple thing in my mind because Microsoft Word makes it very easy to create a, a list, but I've discovered a lot of people just will use the hyphen to denote a particular list item, or they'll type in a one and then a parentheses, or even a one and then a dot, and think that it's a list. And the thing is that that's actually not a proper list, uh, not one that uh, a screen reader would read out to somebody who is requiring a screen reader to go through the material. So the, the purpose of using a proper list is again, back in the HTML structure where you will have an unordered list or an ordered list. And for a screen reader, it will actually read it out as, this is a list of eight items, or this is a list of eight unordered items. So now the person who can't see gets an idea that, say, a visual person like you and I right now can see that the list that I'm looking at has eight items. We see that, but a person who is blind would not be able to know that unless the screen reader told them that, and the screen reader won't tell them that unless it's a properly coded or properly styled or structured list. And so again, nice and simple, very easy to create. Uh, it's just a matter of using the little buttons, the little tools in our, our various different types of document uh, that we use to create documents. The third item is links. So a lot of people will copy and paste a link from the, you know, the web browser and put it into their document. Um, if you've ever used uh, a link like Amazon, to maybe you wanted to point out a book or some kind of resource, uh, those links are really long. And from a screen reader perspective, they literally read that out loud, right? So they do read the HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash WW, and then, you know, whatever that long, complicated uh, you know, code that comes in after, that gets read out loud. So what we want to do is create meaningful links. So instead of uh, putting the entire Amazon URL uh, after the name of the book, you make the book itself the link, right? You apply that link to the name of the book. You also don't use um, ambiguous link uh, names like click here or read more, because again, from a screen reader perspective, uh, a person using that technology can actually get a list of all the links that are on this page so they can find them quickly. But if all they hear is click here, click here, click here, it's meaningless. It, it, they have no clue what they're clicking to go to. So if you're actually listing out the name of a book and it will be announced that it is a link, 
then that's all they need to know. They, they got the name of the book. They know where they're going. So that's important to be able to, uh, you know, create those meaningful links. Alt text for images. Again, this is something that uh, we're seeing now on social media. Uh, Instagram recently uh, made it so that putting alt text for images is much easier, uh, as is some of the other social media entities like Twitter, uh, where it's important for a person who can't see the image to know what the image is about, especially if your image has text on it because they can't see the text, right? So it seems like such a simple thing uh, to essentially you know, type out the text for images. What gets challenging is uh, you know, the context of an image. So like for me, when I put in say my profile image, uh, say I've got my profile page where you meet the instructor or something like that. Um, you know, I, I think even I, at the beginning, I just would put my name, Audrey Blumenau. But then I was thinking, well, but a person who's blind doesn't even know what that means. Like, what am I looking at? Um, it could be me walking on the beach. It could be me sitting at my desk. It could be, um, you know, a portrait uh, photo. And then what do I look like? So now I can explain, you know, headshot of Audrey Blumenau smiling with dark rimmed glasses and brown hair. And now the person who can't see my image has a much better sense of what that image is about, right? Um, I know when I, when I teach my web design class, I had a student who put in uh, five pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge and had named or used alternative text uh, for the images as Golden Gate Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge. And I was like, hmm, when I look at those pictures, what I'm seeing is an aerial view of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I'm seeing another picture that has uh, the Golden Gate Bridge encased in fog. I have another photo of somebody walking on the bridge and looking out towards San Francisco. And immediately we got you and everybody else got a better sense of what these different images were about. And that's the whole point. We're trying to describe the image to somebody who can't see it. Now, of course, like I said, context matters. So maybe in my content that goes along with the image, I might be describing the incredible fog that, you know, encased the Golden Gate Bridge when we were visiting it, then I'm not wanting to repeat that in my alternate text, then I might want to uh, shorten it and make it a little bit uh, more specific, again, to somebody who can't see what's happening. So it can be a tricky thing. There's no right or wrong on this one. But what it does mean, and this is the hard part or the time consuming part, is that I have to check every single image in order to make sure that it, it actually describes what it says it describes. And based on the content, I have to check to see if that matches or is repetitive or redundant. Um, so it gets a little tricky on that one. Tables um, are another uh, somewhat of a headache for somebody who is blind, because if it's not accessible, meaning that there's no caption, so we don't even know what the, cap the table is about, it doesn't contain any table headings for either the columns or the rows, depending on what kind of uh, table it is, can be very confusing to a person who has to listen to a complex table. So keeping tables as simple as possible and using the proper headings for the rows and the columns is gonna be very critical for a person using assistive technology. Color contrast and application, another really big topic. Uh, this is something where, um, you know, I don't know how your eyesight is, but I know I'm challenged when I see uh, gray text on top of a gray background. Uh, it's, it's very hard to read and it's very tiring to read when there's not enough contrast. But I feel like I have pretty good eyesight, but there are people who have very limited eyesight to begin with, or they're colorblind. 
And so now suddenly what seemed like a good contrast to me when I used that orange text on my background actually is very difficult for a person uh, who is colorblind. It is literally gray on gray. And, you know, I, I find that that is something that we probably need to pay more attention to because uh, there's far more men that have colorblindness than women. And I think it's like one in four men or one in five men who have colorblindness. And it's not a visible thing. It's not like, hey, I've got colorblindness. It's not something we announce to the world. It's something we kind of keep to ourselves. Um, and so, you know, this is a problem when we use color for certain applications. Um, the classic example is the, uh, the London uh, underground map where it shows the green line and the red line and the blue line. And all they have are green and yellow and blue lines. And if you're colorblind for green or yellow or blue, <laughs> It's just a bunch of gray lines that you're seeing and you have no idea which one is which. It's almost impossible to really discern which one is which. So we need to have some kind of additional indicators like triangles or squares or circles or you know some kind of symbol to go along with that color so that it's understandable to everybody, right? And then for somebody who, uh, you know, has to, uh, you know, is deaf or something and is listening to uh, videos, captioning is, is critical and not just captioning, but accurate captioning. Um, I found so many uh, ca uh, captioned videos on YouTube, right? They're, they're captioned, but if you actually look at the captioning, um, it's pretty awful. And in the beginning days that I was putting on YouTube videos to my classes to share videos, um, I was actually horrified when I had a video uh, in one of my course materials and I had a deaf student in my class. And I was just double checking to make sure everything was okay. And I realized that that video was talking about moving uh, pictures from one folder to another and, you know, creating that uh, folder of original photos and uh, photos that were going to go on the website. And the way it came out in the closed captions was you're going to move the bitches into this other folder. And, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, that's, that's horrible. And that's like a mild example of, you know, some of the things that are going on let alone punctuation. Um, so there's little to no punctuation in, in many caption videos. So accurate captioning is mandated for people to fully understand, obviously, what's being said uh, if you're deaf or hard of hearing, but not only deaf or hard of hearing. Maybe it's, it's a person who speaks with a very strong accent. Um, in this particular video, it was somebody from New Zealand, and it was very challenging, uh, even for myself. Uh, you know, there are, there are English speakers who speak with very heavy dialects. Um, you know, even within London, you've got like six different dialects, and they're very difficult uh, for somebody who's new to really fully understand. So, you know, accurate captioning is not just for the deaf and hard of hearing, it's for everybody. And then of course, uh, you know, audio transcripts, uh, for somebody who's deaf, you, you have to have transcripts for a person if you have any kind of audio on your uh, website or in your course material. So, there are some very challenging accessibility documents that are out there. <laughs> Math, physics, chemistry, oh my. <laughs> um, these are the ones that are definitely giving me a run for the money, um, if not because math was never my strong suit, but then for uh, screen readers to read formulas correctly is a whole nother ball game out there. Uh, and this is an area that I'm learning a lot about right now, too. So there are some tools for math in the digital world. Uh, LaTeX is a form of typesetting that separates math 
and normal text in its display. And then we have math ML. It's like HTML, but it's math ML. So it's a markup language um, that is a low level format for describing mathematics as a basis for machine to machine communication. Um, math ML is not intended for editing by hand. Uh, it, but it is something that's handled by specialized authoring tools such as equation editors or for export to or from other math packages. So math type is a commonly used software that's designed to help type and handwrite mathematical notation to easily include quality math equations and documents and digital content. And math type, actually, there's, they also have something called chem type for chemistry. Uh, it's available for desktop, web, Google Docs, uh, Word, and on iPads now. Um, it tends to be recommended um, to be used uh, when creating equations in MS Word. Um, it gives the greatest number of uses for math once it's been created. And that document then can be exported to HTML or an EPUB or even used as is. And it can create both LaTeX and MathML. Uh, charts and graphs are another challenging uh, thing to make accessible. So I grabbed this particular chart from a, a workshop I had attended. Uh, this is an example of um, really making a chart accessible by having the labels outside of the pie chart, having, uh, you know, uh, directional arrows or uh, lines to the section of the chart out to the uh, information. Um, and so, and the colors are uh, enough contrast that if somebody is colorblind, that you'll still see enough contrast. But again, that needs to be probably tested. And there are web tools, uh, there's Chrome extensions that you can get that can check these kinds of things. Um, or you can use a table. Right, so you know we have to sort of compare and contrast. Is that uh, pie chart that was here, is this more accessible or less accessible than having it sit in a chart? This table is probably more accessible because we have a header. Uh, hopefully, it's a header for response and number of respondents and percentage of respondents. Uh, this is something that could be a lot easier for a person using a screen reader to go through this material. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, PDF documents, these are all required to be meeting accessibility uh, guidelines. So everything that we use in education, and these are the big documents that are used in, by educators, all of them have to meet and pass the accessibility requirements that a website has to also pass. Uh, PDFs are, are probably the worst of, of the crowd. They are extraordinarily time consuming to make accessible. And unless you know something about HTML and tags, um, it's extraordinarily confusing to make accessible. Uh, if you start with your Word document and make that accessible, it is easier to make your PDF accessible. You can convert it to a PDF document. Unfortunately, things get lost in translation sometimes, and so you do have to always triple check to make sure that even though your Word document passed accessibility, you've got to double check to make sure your PDF document meets accessibility and oftentimes it doesn't oftentimes there's still a few more things that you have to fix or recalibrate because whatever you did in word or excel or in powerpoint didn't quite translate over and i you know i'm on groups about pdf accessibility and it's just painful <laughs> so i usually try to talk people out of uh, using pdfs if at all possible uh, I know PDFs are, are in many ways the go-to document, and I've used them for years and years and, you know, myself for everything, but I'm starting to kind of step away from them because they frustrate me tremendously. 
the tools that we use in the world of of education, and this is not by any means um, all the tools, but the tools that I've been using myself um, are built into Canvas. We use a, a platform, a learning management system called Canvas, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Canvas learning management uh, tool, but it is very popular. It's used around the world uh, by all the top universities. All the community colleges use Canvas and almost all the UCs and CSUs use Canvas and many high schools use them as well. Uh, so they have a built-in accessibility checker and it's probably uh, the very basic, basic checker. Uh, it's, it's the first step to checking. Uh, Pope, uh, John Pope uh, created a, a company called John or Pope Technology. Uh, it's based off of the Web Aim Wave technology tool that many uh, people use to check for accessibility for a website. Uh, and he was able to create something that was incorporated into Canvas. So it's, it's part of Canvas and it provides a second level of accessibility checking for content within Canvas. Uh, we encourage people to use a color contrast checker. Uh, I usually use the web aim color contrast checker to make sure that we're adhering to uh, the level two, the double A uh, accessibility contrast. Uh, we use Grackle. Some schools use Grackle for Google Docs. If it's a, a Google campus, then usually Grackle will be the, the accessibility checker for Google Docs and slides. Uh, some community colleges have access to, uh, and I see it came out as Equinox, it should be Equidox for PDF checking. Um, I've only just recently started using it myself. Uh, it's supposed to be better than the accessibility tools within Adobe Acrobat. Uh, so I usually use both at this point, um, getting used to using Equidox myself. Uh, some co colleges will use something called Blackboard Ally. Uh, Ally is a tool that's based on three different tiers. The first tier is for students, so that they can take, say, a Canvas content page and co convert it to an HTML page or an eDoc or an ePub, uh, a Braille display, or uh, a Beeline reader, so somebody who has dyslexia. You know, dyslexia is one of those uh, disabilities that's not uh, commonly talked about. Uh, you do it is another tool that was uh, created out of the University of Florida, um, and it's free. It's an open source uh, uh, tool that many of the community colleges also use as a form to check for accessibility. So I wanted to end there. Um, I think that's a good place for me to end. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to answer. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Can you explain what, what Canvas is? Uh, I didn't quite understand what, what, that, what that, is that a tool or is that a format or? Um... So it's a platform. Uh, so it's a learning management platform. So there's many different kinds of learning management platforms that schools might use uh, and Canvas is one of them. So what it does is that it provides uh, a course shell that an instructor will build out their uh, course material using pages and uh, assignments, quizzes, discussion forums, and they build it out to their uh, needs of their course. And, um, and it has lots of tools to do a lot of things. You can embed videos into your uh, lecture notes that are all these Canvas pages, right? Um, there are other learning management tools out there. Moodle is one of the free ones that many schools used for a long time. There's Sakai, there's uh, D to Learn or Desire to Learn. Um, those are a few examples. Uh, Blackboard is another very uh, popular uh, 
learning management system. And uh, Canvas sort of took over the world about 10 years ago uh, because Blackboard wasn't so good at the time for faculty. Uh, Moodle was okay. Uh, and Canvas was built by uh, some students who took it on as a master's thesis project uh, to find a way to make it uh, better for faculty and also for uh, students as well. And it's grown by leaps and bounds. So, so it's something teachers use primarily or, or do students use it also? So it is used for, it is used by faculty to okay. deliver uh, course content okay. to students. So yes, both faculty use it and students use it I mean, to all right. take their online courses, to uh, take tests, to uh, hold discussions with other classmates. Um, you know, every, it's the entire class is now sitting in this uh, learning management system. Hi, I uh, wanted to go back to your uh, question about vis uh, disabilities, visible and invisible. Mm -hmm. um, along with the third one, I was diagnosed with repetitive strain injury in 1999 and ever since I've had to use one of these instead of a mouse because right. it's an accommodation right <laughs> yeah exactly and yeah it's a very minor thing but it was important to me so that that's just one of my own see I guess maybe I'm one of those one in four U.S. adults with a disability I you know I I think those numbers are actually very low um, I, I didn't talk about temporary disabilities. Um, my mom broke her wrist a couple of years ago and guess what? She couldn't type. And so we talked about, you know, voice to text where she could just speak and have the content written for yeah. her. Um, you know, there are things that we don't think about as a disability, but when you can't use your hands for some reason, Hmm, that that's a disability, right? You can't, you can't, you don't have the ability to do what you used to do the same way. So you have to do it a different way. Um, and it's not a bad thing. It's just a different thing, right? I've done some work with accessibility. And one of the things that struck me, especially with, with web pages and HTML is if you do everything that's required for the page to be accessible, it's a better page for everybody. It's yes. not asking you to do bizarre stuff. It's asking you to use H1 for heading one and H2 for heading two and, and to have something that that doesn't turn into gibberish when it goes through a, a reader. And so yeah. it's not, it, it, and, and, oh, and, and oh, I hate website pages where it's like orange text on a same value <laughs> green background and kind of, you know, and it, it, it I have really good color discernment, and I have trouble with some of those pages. Yeah. So, and, and connected to that, there are tons of free tools that will just look at your, they just, you give them your URL and they look at the page and they sit, say, you, you know, you, you're not, you don't have the, enough contrast or you don't have this, you don't have, you know, lots of free checking um, tools and, and stuff. There are, and some are better than others. And in fact, there was, a an article in the New York Times, I believe it was today, because um, I just got it up on my little Twitter feed, um, that there's there's three companies that claim to make your website accessible, right? Access B, I think is how you pronounce the name of that co the company. And I've, I've paid attention to them because it sounds so cool. You just, you buy their package and poof, you know, your, your website is suddenly accessible. Um, with JavaScript, I, you know, I don't know actually how they do that. However, what, um, what they found out was that it actually makes the website less accessible, right? So, you know, this is based on a story of this guy who's blind. Uh, he loves to buy radio equipment and, you know, knickknacks of that sort in the site that he used to always go to and has been accessible to him for, you know, God only knows how long thought that they were making a good decision by purchasing this company's software that would make it more accessible. And now he can't buy anything anymore from this company because he can't 
access it. And it's an overlay of some sort. And I don't know exactly how it works. I, I just saw it today and didn't have a chance to read through it all. But I bookmarked it because mm. um, it's kind of uh, disconcerting when companies are coming out saying that they're they're trying to make it accessible and they're not. And like you said, it's really it's such simple HTML. Okay. If you just stick with the basic structure, you will have an accessible website. Are there other things we can do? Yeah, sure. And there's lots of new tags coming out that the browsers and the screen readers are catching up to um, that are going to make it more accessible. And that's great. But boy, the simple basic structure of HTML right there, you, you got it. And if you just stick with that, you're good. But hmm. There's so many that don't, and it's just uh, frustrating um, to me because it doesn't have to be so complicated. But so Audrey, you know, we're uh, humans. Is your um, is are your presentation materials going to be available to uh, to us? I certainly can send them. I'll send them to Nikki because I've got her. Uh, I think I might have all of yours. I don't know who who was on the initial uh, email when you contacted me, but I'll definitely send it to uh, Nikki. In fact, I, I, I sort of depended on how much time I had, but it, my presentation is not accessible because I thought, well, it'd be fun to just say, take a look at my presentation and, and uh, pick it apart for not being accessible. So, um, you know, I, I sometimes like to, to take stuff that I've done and say, hey, look at this not accessible, how do we fix it? But I wasn't sure how much time we had and, and I see it's already 8.30, so obviously I won't have time to do it now. So I'm just gonna put that out there right now that it's not accessible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll appreciate it anyway. Of course, it, of course. It, it, has, it has a lot of information in it. It was very uh, dense and detailed and, and it would be nice to be able to refer back to it for reference. Absolutely. I completely understand. I, I know that too. So. I was interested in, in what you were saying about PDFs. I've never thought about making a PDF accept, accessible because I just think about PDFs as this static thing, but readers have to deal with those too. Oh um, my goodness, yes. And once a month, um, I co-edit a, uh, a newsletter for Scottish fiddlers. And, oh, how fun. Uh, <laughs> and I think that the this is for the San Francisco Scottish Fiddlers, which is a really large, and it's it's not just Scottish fiddling, it's all kinds of fiddling, but yeah. fiddle. But um the uh I don't know if we have any vision impaired readers, but I, it makes me think we should either switch to something not PDF or I should figure out how to make PDF. I mean I, we do it, we write it in Word, we use all the word styles pretty religious that's like good all the headings and stuff i don't know how much of that gets across in the right way to, to uh, pdf it's, though it's fairly good um what tends to be excuse me more challenging is sometimes the reading order or uh, um there might be tags if you threw in an image or something like that but if it's really just straight text it can be pretty straightforward and not be too nightmarish. It's when people start throwing in charts and images and columns and you know rearranging and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, it becomes almost impossible um, in my mind to try to make it accessible. But if it's just a simple standard, uh, it's fairly simple. There's a little bit of like having having an image where. Um, the, the text flows around in a regular shaped image, um, but it doesn't get cuter than that. Yeah, and, and sometimes those images that are having text float around aren't going to meet accessibility, even in Word, if you check it there. Um, so the, the accessibility checker in uh, PDFs, uh, I usually go to the wizard because it has an accessibility checker there. And it just kind of takes you through all of the different mm. things that it looks for. So like a title. Um, I, I remember the first time I did my syllabus, it had somebody else's name on the on the accessibility checker. And it had a completely different class name in the title because my I had just gotten the job and they they sent me a template and I didn't even think about the template. So 
So my my uh, student who's blind was going to read it out as a dance uh, syllabus and not a web design syllabus, um, <laughs> you know, because that's what I got. Uh, so those are those little things that I really appreciate from the Adobe Acrobat accessibility checker in in the wizard. Um, because it'll take you through all those steps and make sure that it's accurate. But then there's reading order that it won't check for, and there's color contrast that it won't check for. Um, and those are the kinds of things that you just have to double check. I found that it's pretty good at bringing in the alt text from images. Um, but again, I feel like I always have to double check that to make sure. Um, but yeah, PDFs, I mean, they're, you know, any document that you share, it, even your email, should be accessible. Uh, I don't know if you use Microsoft Outlook for your email, but there is an accessibility checker in Microsoft Outlook. And, you know, I think people just need to know that the tools are there so that they start just like a spell check, just like, you know, doing a grammar check, you know, that we just add in, let's do an accessibility check before we send things out. Because again, people aren't going to tell you, they don't want to have to, uh, you know, show, uh, you know, that they're uh, having some kind of disability, right? So that's just what you, you know, we don't want to have to out people for their disabilities or have to ask or request, you know, that this is something that they need. Um, so they might not tell you, they might have, you know, somebody else next to them, hey, could you read this for me? Because I'm having trouble reading this, right? What, what, what is the wizard? Is that a website? No, it's actually built into Adobe Acrobat. Um, I don't know if I, let me see if I have uh, something that I can open up real quick here. Let me. Is it in the cheap version or just the full pro version? <laughs> it's, the, it's the pro version. So yeah, you do have to, uh, you do have to purchase it. Um, let's see if I can open something up here really quickly. It's open. It's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can. Go find. Okay, you you've stopped sharing, so you, we we can't see your screen. Yeah, well, I'm actually looking for my file really quickly, so you probably don't want to see the mess that's on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see, let me jump over to this document here. Oh. And come on. Do you love it? It's always, it go, it always goes slow when you just want to do something really quickly. I just did a, a search uh, in DuckDuckGo on free PDF accessibility checker. Uh -huh. And uh, there are a bunch of hits. Um, oh, ethics. so that that might be another thing to look at there's definitely um a lot out there for sure um here let's grab this one this is actually an old one but uh, okay let me share my screen again make sure i'm in the right place here oops Okay, so you should see my syllabus for Cabot 161. And so what I do is um, you can go to tools and then scroll down to, uh, you'll see that there's something called accessibility. But what I usually do is I usually go to the action wizard at the bottom here. And you'll see on the right, it'll say make accessible. And so I will run through this. There's a start button that will essentially take me through all these different things. Um, this is where I can check the title to make sure it's the correct title. Um, then I can go in and just go through each of these different things that it checks uh, to make sure that it, it's correct. And so any searchable image, it will convert that. Um, if there's any form fields, um, you know, I don't have any form fields, so I can skip that step. The reading language should be set to English. Um, it'll look for any images or figures uh, and let me know if there's anything missing. So 
this is where, you know, it's highlighting that uh, horizontal, you know, bar that I've got there. That's a decorative image. So I'll just mark that as decorative. And then I can go to the next thing and you know, I've got this additional, it, it highlights things in kind of a weird way. Um, and then I can go in here and say decorative and decorative for this one as well. Close that. And then I just leave everything to the default here and start checking. And then it will pull, pull together a whole list of things on the left-hand side. So the two issues that will always be there is the logical reading order and the color contrast. These are things that I have to check myself because it doesn't know. Um, and then I see that it does have some kind of issue with a heading. Um, and so now I have to go find out, you know, it didn't like this partic particular element. You know, I'm not sure why, uh, but now I have to go and this is where it gets complicated because now I got to figure out well, what is wrong with this element. I thought it was a heading one. Um, why isn't it? And then you have to go through this whole uh, rigmarole to go to options or go into the tags panel to find out what's going on with that. And it looks like it was an H4. God only knows why it was set to H4, right? <laughs> this is like, even I'm thinking that doesn't even make any sense. So I can come in here and I can change that to an H1, which is what it should have been. And now, you know, if I go back and check that, oops, go back here to my accessibility checker. The problem there was that it did not understand why you were starting with H4. Exactly. So, you know, just like, you know, any document, we start off with the highest level heading, which should yeah. be H1, yeah. right? And I don't know why this got suddenly written as an H4. I'm almost positive that my, my Word document was an H1, right? Okay. So it's those kinds of things that you just have to check. And, um, you know, it's, it's always kind of a challenge on, you know, how things work and why. But the reading order is the other part that tends to be a bit of a challenge. So, you know, when I click on that little, looks like a Z, that's the reading order. So it should read, you know, a syllabus. I don't know what the number two here is for, but I'll, I'll kind of work my way through, but it should be, you know, one, two, three, four, um, and then five. And then if I go to the next page, um, it should be, you know, coursework grading, and then two is the description, three is the table, four. So that makes, that's logical reading order. That's how I would see and read this page as well. So uh, I can at least see that this is working in the world of the screen reader as well. And I could test this in a screen reader, right? I could bring up my, you know, Mac screen reader um, voiceover and, you know, get the, you um, know, you know, information from there as well and find out what it sounds like. And sometimes that can be an eye-opening experience as well. <laughs> so I have a, I have a, another question here. I mean, be, between a, a clean, well-organized document and an accessible document, how much manual extra work is there? There's a typo there. Well, you know, I think, um, when you start off with a clean document, the chances of it being accessible are much higher, right? If you start off in, in Microsoft Word with this document and you, you, start, you apply the styles as you should and apply the lists and colors the way you should, then the chances of it being accessible are so much greater, right? It's usually when you decide to make a change and you move an image over here and then you decide you're going to move this section over to that section, then the reading order can get sometimes messed up. Um, if you keep things very straightforward, um, it's so much easier. But sometimes there are columns involved and um, that's when things get complicated. What, what controls the reading order? A lot of the times it's how you started writing something and when you entered that information in. 
So, you know, if I came in and started, you know, class meetings and then I decided actually I want to add something else to that section and I, you know, copied and pasted something before class meetings, that might be seen as a completely new section. And all of a sudden it gets named as section six because um, it was the last thing that was added to that particular page. Um, I'm going to say that that isn't always true. I, I sometimes think that that's the way it works. And then I have an example where it, it's not like that. Um, so it's all, it's different, different times, but it, it tends to feel like it's always the last thing that I wrote would be in that sequence, no matter where I put it on the page, if that makes sense. I understand it. I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> And it, it is possible to fix the reading order. You know, it's just it's just a, another step. And this is this is part of why I'm not a big fan of PDFs because there's a lot of little details in here that just take up a lot more time. Um, but if you have a clean document, you know that the reading order makes sense and everything, then it's great. Um, you know, that's, there's jobs, there are people that that's what they do now is they make PDFs accessible. And what, and what would you, if you don't like PDFs, what else, what do you like instead? Well, an HTML web page is probably the easiest. Um, you know, you could use a Google doc, you could use a Word doc. Um, you know, those tend to be easier to make okay. accessible. Uh, but they sometimes can have their issues as well. So PDFs are still, you know, the predominant form of documentation. Um, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime. Really? I think that we just need to be aware of the tools to make the content accessible. And, mm -hmm. you know, once you get kind of into the flow of it, it, it gets a little easier but I know in terms of training, um, I know I have to take it usually in slow steps because there's a lot of things to think about and a lot of things to um, try to fix and figure out how to fix. So usually in, in trainings, um, and I've, I've attended trainings too, they're usually two, three hours of training and um, it's a lot of information, so. Well, we could keep you here all night, but probably like uh, you, <laughs> you have a life. Um, we 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 appreciate this very much, and uh, I have here. This is what we present our. Uh, where where's my camera? This is what we present our uh, speakers with our our it's our coveted uh, STC Berkeley chapter mug. It's uh, it's an <laughs> anachronism now since we're not called the Berkeley chapter anymore, but. But the, we have a lot of these mugs still, and uh, we will uh, see that you get one uh, if we if we get your uh, uh, get a place to ship it. Yeah, to. there there won't be uh, uh, there won't be any more of those made. <laughs> Very special <laughs> clicker item. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now, and um, and then if anybody has something they want to say post-recording we can do that well thank you very